to this amazing space. This is the largest presenting uh, lecture room in Queens College. So here you are. You have the premier uh, place, the premier spotlight. I'd like to thank Queens College for hosting us here, an amazing um, collaboration that makes this possible. Um, there is nothing like seeing the product of your own labor and be visited by, by, by the public. And in your case, it's the peers. Um, too often, our papers just disappear into a vacuum of some hard drive or in the depths of some um, drawer and never to be seen again. There is something to be said about a performance, whether you are on stage, being a magical activist, or whether you read a poem during a, a a reading or whether you publish your own article, whether you do a research project and then show, show it off. Uh, all of it is really, really, really special. That's why we do it. We don't do it for the A plus, we do it for these moments. And, well, here is our chance for one of these moments. And uh, with that in mind, enjoy it. You will be here in three, two, or a year's time, uh, and we will be just as excited to have you here. Um, without any further ado, because we have a tremendous amount of presenters here, I, I just want to welcome you and uh, kick off this, this amazing day, uh, two days, uh, non-stop, this is going to be non-stop for two days. This is like your brain power manifested in a real college. Most college students don't get to do this, but you do get to do this. Without any further ado, thank you so much. Welcome for uh, here. And good luck, everyone. Twilight climbing scene. 
in which Edward utters perhaps the most jarring piece of dialogue in the entire genre. He proceeds to take Bella on a wilderness tour through a fort, climbing over mountains and up trees to show the picturesque views of the Washington landscape. Now keep that image of Edward climbing in mind as you read this quote from Dracula. But my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall, just as a lizard moves along the wall. Now, they're essentially doing the same thing, right? Crawling, climbing, um, but one is portrayed very differently than the other. Uh, Dracula is lizard-like, whereas Edward is like this dashing hero. You could even say Edward's climbing scene is the yassified version of Dracula's climbing scene. I mean, and we don't feel repulsion and terror when watching Edward, or at least we're not supposed to. <laughs> so how do Meyer and Stoker manage to portray their vampire characters in such different lights? Well, one way is by framing their characters differently within their particular societal context. It's clear that Stoker intended Dracula to be a foreign outside villain and nothing more. You know, he's this Transylvanian noble who lives in a creepy castle in the middle of nowhere, a far cry from Stoker's civilized British narrators who fear that he's going to go to London to satiate his lust for blood. And well, what do you know? He goes to London and does exactly that, leaving a trail of death and destruction in his wake and um, being basically just being a drain on British society, literally and figuratively. Um, Meyer and her vampires, on the other hand, are different. Uh, Deborah much calls it a complete reversal of the traditional desire of the vampire. They want to fit into human society, so much so that they even ascribe to a human dietary code. Meyer subverts perhaps the most recognizable vampire trope by making her vampires self-proclaimed vegetarians. They don't drink human blood. And it doesn't stop there. The vampires continually reconcile their otherworldly natures with their desires to benefit or even just to fit into human society. Edward uses his superhuman strength to protect rather than prey on Bella. I mean, they even play baseball. You don't get much more typical American suburbia than that. Other than the fact that they have to play during a thunderstorm to match the, the superhuman crack of the bat. So in this way, Meyer humanizes the Cullen's most predatory characteristics, stripping them of their darkness and countercultural natures and painting them as romanticized heroes. And if this illustrious fan edit is any indication, it worked. Fans ate it up. I mean, Edward, like Dracula, is an outsider, but he doesn't want to be, and that makes all the difference. We see this continuous shift in great character depiction when it comes to Dracula being portrayed as the Antichrist and Twilight being portrayed as the common Christian man. So Dracula is first seen as the Antichrist because of his bastardization of Christian sacraments, specifically when he forces Mina to feed off of his chest. Um, this is a mockery of Christian Holy Communion in which Christians drink the blood of Christ in order, drink wine in order to symbolize the blood of Christ and the unity that they have with him. Through the forced drinking of blood, Dracula shows utter disdain for the eternal life offered through Christ's blood, therefore portraying him as the other and Antichrist. Greatly contrasting this in Twilight, Edward is like the common Christian man as he maintains an abstinent romantic relationship. By participating in abstinence, Edward is given a solid moral character. He becomes more desirable as he is more like the common Christian man and as a result is more accepted in society. Through the shift in vampiric portrayal, it can be clearly seen that the integration of Christian religion is a necessary factor for the other or the vampire to be seen as truly human-like and be more integrated into society. This immense shift in the depiction of vampires is not only seen in male vampires, but also the female vampires. We'll first take a look at the novel Dracula. As a human, Lucy attracted multiple suitors because she was seen as pure and virtuous. However, once she becomes a vampire, this impression vastly changes as she becomes sexualized. The change in Lucy's description from radiantly beautiful to voluptuous wantonness illustrates her lack of true femininity as she no longer conforms to the beauty standards and behavioral expectations that accommodate male desires. This then turns her to a threat against traditional gender expectations, thereby portraying vampires solely as villains in Dracula. In the Twilight Saga, Bella is first viewed in a similar way. Throughout the first movie, Edward persistently comes to her rescue and Bella quickly becomes his damsel in distress that allows him to embrace traditional masculinity and becomes her protector. In fact, that is her only personality trait. <laughs> Edward is reluctant to turn Bella into a vampire because if Bella gains all the powers that come with vampirism, her need for his protection ceases to exist, 
Deprive a member of the dominance he currently possesses in their relationship. So Edward waits until Bella is domesticated in her role as a wife and mother. Bella gives birth to her and Edward's half-human, half-vampire baby. And literally two seconds after Bella gives birth to this crime against nature, <laughs> Edward injects Bella with his venom because he now views her as worthy of the gift of vampirism. Bella's vampirism then allows her to remain domesticated as a wife and mother, fulfilling traditional gender roles for eternity, which portrays Bella as one of society's heroes. Now, from Dracula to Twilight, there's a swap in masculine gender roles and vampires, from the predator to the killer. We have Dracula, who attacks girls in their sleep, and Edward Coley, who waits for consent and doesn't do anything more than kissing until marriage. Evidently, he is afraid to hurt Bella. He's even vegetarian. He only sucks animals' blood, and blood, or the consummation of, in this context, symbolizes virginity and intimacy, maybe 145. Edward's straight up refusal to partake in human blood shows he is chaster and holier than other vampires. Now, Twilight's vampires fit in well. They are superhumanly good vampires. They're super hot, super rich, super strong, and able to suppress their own bloodthirst. Uh, this is as compared to old traditional vampires like Dracula, who are old and musty. And a direct example of justification is that while traditional vampires burn in the sun, Edward Cullen sparkles. <laughs> but even though Edward is sparkly, he suffers because he has guilt for being a vampire. Even though he's attractive, even though he's a vegetarian vampire, he hates himself because he can't fully conform to human society. No matter how much he suppresses parts of himself, he only thinks, this is the skin of a killer Bella. Now, this self-awareness is not afforded to the purely sexual predator test minority stereotype of Dracula. It was a deliberate change in vampiric portrayal by Stephanie Meyer. This yossifies his emotional depth and only adds to our ability to sympathize with him as a sexual minority oppressed and guilted by human-centric society. So we've talked extensively about the differences between Count Dracula and Edward Cullen, and now I'm going to delve into the literary and cinematic choices that contribute to that yossification. So when talking about Bram Stoker's novel, it's really important to consider individual narrative. Are we hearing from this character? Do we understand their point of view, their origin story, any justification for their wrongdoing? And I would give you some examples here, but they don't exist. Dracula doesn't get any insight into his um, psychological and inner world. We only hear it from him, from the other characters. Um, and to them, he seems like an animal, someone panther-like, someone with sharp and canine teeth. This is the other, an outsider, and an example of what we in polite society should not be imitating. We want to align sympathies with the human narrators against Dracula, just like Stoker intended. Now, transitioning into the cinematic beauty of Twilight. This is primarily a romance, not a horror film. Vampirism is secondary to who Edward is as a character. It's almost like a disability that he fights against. It's not his identity. Um, scholar Lisa Bode talks about some interesting choices in cinema that are made here. The lingering close-ups of beautiful faces. We can see kind of staring death matches going on here, one-sided. Um, and there's an iconic bluish filter, the blue lens. Um, nature is a prominent part of the story. There is a wistful and melancholic score throughout the film. This all sets the scene for us to receive Edward as a romantic character, as a Yossi version of the vampire. And of course, he's a typical dreamy Hollywood love interest. But is this really a good thing to accept the outsider despite sacrifices they might make to assimilate and the red flags and dangerous and vicious parts of their nature? It's important to consider that Twilight has been a cultural sensation despite those questions. Here are a couple <laughs> aspirational fan collages to prove it. <laughs> you can say that they really drank it up. Um, Bella is almost like a self-insert character. Here we see her in romantic scenarios with Edward many times as fans desire it. They want to feel closer to Edward as a romantic partner so that they can accept one another for their faults. But when we look at Count Dracula, he's posing a threat to English society and the main characters. And they want to vanquish him so that they can feel secure and accepted themselves with no threat from the outsider. 
When we talk about the ossification of the vampire, this is just reflecting what we as an audience want, love and acceptance. Thank you. Future behaviors. 
Our texts have shown that society tends to alienate those who don't fit the norm. So for our purposes, we're going to be focusing on physical appearance. And this label that is forced upon these characters, as Sophia mentioned, stems from their physical deformities and follows them throughout the, the entirety of their story. And then this theory lies on the psychological foundation of the self-fulfilling prophecy. In this diagram, you see a perfect description of how cyclical the process really is. The key element is that one cannot escape this process and that oftentimes, any person's attempt to escape will push them further into their cycle. Labels become self-fulfilling. We are what we are, what our labels are, even though we try not to be. So in Frankenstein, upon the monster's first creation, Frankenstein states, the beauty of the dream vanished, and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. So immediately, the readers see this very negative self-image posed upon the monster, which follows him throughout the entirety of the story. Because any humans that the monster encounters judge him initially based off of that ugly face that you guys see right here, and have this very negative reaction towards him. And this is not simply a coincidence, because when he meets a blind man, he doesn't see the physical deformity and therefore cannot judge him and have that societal reaction based on this label of a monster that he has. Similarly, in Phantom, before Christine rips off the Phantom's mask and see his, sees his deformed face, she refers to him only as her angel of music, a very positive, very positive label. However, when she pulls off the mask, then she, she pulls back and discuss, she's disgusted by what she sees and further refers to him only as the Phantom with this negative label that follows him throughout the entirety of the play. So now that we have an understanding of the self-fulfilling prophecy as well as um, how and why labels come about, let's take a look at social rejection and aggression in the text that we see here. So first we need to understand the motivations of our characters and of people in general who face rejection. So there was a link found between repeated uh, incidents of social rejection and physical or verbal aggression. Um, and a study by um, William Kipling showed that there is a link that school shooters often face social rejection and as a result re uh, resorted to these violent actions. And we also need to keep in mind that one's behaviors are based on a multitude of factors such as personality and emotional resources, uh, which include the environment that they both grew up in and are currently in. So as we take a look at Frankenstein, we're going to look at this quote. Uh, the context for this is that uh, Frankenstein's monster is murdering his creator's little brother. You know, fun times. So the child still struggled and loaded me with epithets which carried despair in my heart. I grasped his throat to silence him, and in a moment he lay dead at my feet. I gazed on my victim, and my heart swelled with exultation and hellish triumph. So as we can see here, the monster uses very eloquent language to describe this horrible act that he's committed. Um, and this kind of reflects how he has this longing to be accepted um, into society and speak as though he is a human, but at the same time, he does um, still do these things that purposely put harm onto them because he feels in this self-fulfilling prophecy that he is the monster that they have labeled him as, and thus that's how he must act. Now, we also see this in Phantom, um, and I'm just going to read the quote and then I'll explain. So, start a new life with me, buy his freedom with your love, refuse me, and you send your lover to his death. This is the choice, this is the point of no return. So the context of this is that Phantom has kidnapped his lover, Christine, or his want-to-be lover, um, and threatens to murder her lover as a result of her not loving him. He views himself as this disgusting creature that isn't worthy of real, true love and sees love as more of a transaction rather than something that you actually gain from caring about one another. So this is another um, example of self-fulfilling prophecy because he is seen to only think that because he is this phantom that he can never have true human love. So what have our authors, how have they taken these ideas of labeling and aggression and implemented them into their works of literature? So both Mary Shelley and Andrew Lloyd Webber have proven the existence of a cycle describing the relationship between the, our labeled monsters and the rest of society. So this cycle of isolation begins with our characters wanting something. They want platonic relationships, they want romantic love, they want familial ties. They all want something that is considered a natural human desire. And so our characters go and they create a plan in order to, um, which requires them to break their label and join the rest of society. 
However, once this plan is, um, is carried out, society does not let them finish, reacting with outward aggression, usually um, horrific violence, um, which causes our labeled monsters to have an aggressive outburst of their own, internalizing um, their society's reaction and turns into violence against them. In Frankenstein, the Frankenstein's monster, after having been brutally beaten by these cottagers nearly half to death in which he wanted to gain their attention and affection, finds Richard Frankenstein's younger brother, William, and murders him in cold blood. Similarly, Frank, uh, the Phantom of the Opera, after being unmasked by Christine, he goes on a murderous rampage, coming to a climax with the attempted murder of Christine's lover, Raoul. Over time, these, um, the, the consequence of these actions is that it only brings them further and further apart from society. Uh, and, this, and over time, this cycle can repeat again, effectively trapping them in this cycle in which there is no escape. The more that these characters try to escape and break their cycle, this label, they are trapped in this cycle and trapped in their label. So now I would ask all of you to please take off your label, just go, rip it off, throw it in the garbage on your way out. All of you that have now just taken off your label, you have effectively assimilated into society. You have, on your own terms, you have changed the way society views you. This is a right and a privilege that our labeled monsters will never get to have. As we as a society, we thrive and flourish off of the creation of labels in order to maintain and establish social order. But in our thesis text, we have seen the consequence of establishing such labels. We give labels of monster, wretch, and fiend to those with physical deformities based solely on their appearance. However, this in turn, this makes our labeled monsters believe in what we are telling them. They believe that they are hideous monsters, undeserving of natural human desires. We are creating these monsters. We are, we are making them believe that they are hideous and undeserving of love. We are blaming them for our wrongdoings and our actions. Do we really want to continue perpetuating this cycle of labeling to those who look different than us? Thank you, guys.
Yeah, I just saw, I just saw it up there.
and we're doing it. Oh, we're right. Okay. All right, so I've got to come in, fill in the first available role. We'll be all the way to the end. We're going to begin in a few minutes.
The rest of you, start filling in the back rows. You see a seat, take it. Sometimes one can feel lonely without necessarily being alone. It is not just an individual that can experience isolation, but also a pair of people who must learn to balance the societal expectations of twinship and the relationship with one another. In this presentation, we will take you through the history and culture of twins, how literature leans on the negative psychology of twins, which then causes conflict in their internal environment, and how media perpetuates the negative attitudes towards twins. Starting off, we have history. With everything said in the introduction, it begs the question, where do these negative attitudes towards twins originate from? So throughout ancient stories, a common thread surrounding twins is the idea of fratricide. Fratricide, which is the killing of one sibling, is seen in Greek myths, religious stories, and cultural legends. For instance, the biblical story of the firstborn twin sons, Cain and Abel, was a story that led to fratricide due to Cain's jealousy over Abel's success, successful sacrifice for God. 
In Greek mythology, one common twin trope was heteropaternal superfecundation, where one woman would conceive two children, or basically twins, each with different fathers. Usually one was mortal and one was immortal. Leda, the mother of Helen and Clytemnestra, Helen being the famous Helen of Greece, uh, conceived one child with her mortal husband, Cinderius, and the second was conceived the same day when Zeus appeared to her as a swan, as seen in the second image. These depictions of twins are seen in antiquity and as influences for famous Renaissance painters such as Bocci, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and more, and presents them, or twins, as beasts and animals. Furthermore, twins are seen as unnerving because of their identical appearances. One of the most well-known twins in history are the conjoined Siamese twins, Chang and Angbo, which is seen in the last picture. They were known for their circus performances in the 19th century, using their appearance as entertainment. Their profession was based on people's openness to quote-unquote monsters. The Bunker twins were widely feared during their time due to how they looked, though it was that fear of those who are different that led to their popularity. In our thesis text for Fearful Symmetry, Nick Benegger uses the elements of psychology of twins to take advantage of the same trope to drive the conflict of the story. To understand the psychology of twins, the first step is to examine predetermined factors that have affected twins. From a biological point of view, twins are destined to be um, codependent from the moment of conception. Having a life partner from the moment of conception causes twins to form their own microenvironment. This affects the psychological and social development of twins, as well as the relationships they form throughout their lives. Another psychological idea used in the novel is the uncanny. Freud's uncanny is defined as something that arouses dread and creepy horror, but is also a sense of familiarity. It is often unsettling to see the double that is twins, but it's not just the physical characteristic of twins that make people feel unsettled, it is their twin bond. Twin relationships are often considered to be one of the most unique and intimate of interpersonal relationships. Since those who are not twins do not understand this bond, twins are secluded and they feel pointed out for being different. As seen in this quote, Nifinuri reinforces the uncanny experience associated with identical twins. All of these psychological experiences are expressed in our thesis text. Deepening our understanding of the main characters, Julia and Valentina, and the nature of their twin relationship. The weight of which ideal has the most impact on their outsider status has yet to be determined. To understand how twins are the true outsiders of society, there must be an examination of their attachment. Growing up with a twin affects how a person develops emotionally, interacts socially, and discovers themselves individually. The inclusive fitness perspective states that twins use one another as attachment figures because they share genes that facilitate bonding and share many experiences. While the theory provides a framework for familial relationships and is applicable to modern twin studies, by implication, it ostracizes twins and highlights the complications of their heightened intimacy. In her beautiful symmetry, Valentina and Julia emphasize a fear of branching out of their relationship and have an extreme attachment to one another. The twins loved the sameness, even as they felt incapable of enduring it for one more minute. This quote shows both the comfort and the need the twins feel in their relationship. Rather than benefiting off of their attachment and closeness, the girls seem to have a harmful dependency, lack their own identity, and are pinned against each other, perpetuating the negative stereotypes of twins. The theory is meant to benefit the relationship, but literature spins it in a damaging light. Their shared genes did not facilitate their bonding, and their attachment hindered their growth as individuals. The negative connotations perpetuated by literature otherizes twins for the sole purpose of furthering a plot. All of that being said, it can be concluded from the previous Concepts that creators would typically take advantage of the negative connotations associated with twins for understanding their purposes. It's important to note the societal influence that modern multimedia has on this idea of friendship and the perpetuation of negative stereotypes. The general consensus surrounding twins seems to focus on their abnormality and the feelings of unease they invoke. Strengthening this connotation is the genre of the book itself. Readers who pick up her vehicle symmetry expect to be greeted with otherworldly figures, death, and perhaps even violence, all typical elements of the horror fiction. The reader has now subsequently associated these elements with the twins that this story centers around, 
And in turn, the novel perpetuates the idea that twins are something to be feared. Most twins in contemporary media fit a certain mold or stereotype that furthers their sense of separation. The Shining film, for example, describes the ghost girls as pale, thin, and young. Similarly, in our thesis text, the authors depict the twins Julia and Valentina as often mistaken for undernourished 12-year-olds. They might have been cast as Victorian orphans in a made-for-TV movie. By, in by including these eerie descriptions, both the author and the director purposely established the twins as uncomfortable or causing uncomfort to those around them. This, in turn, can lead to the twins' isolation because of their association with horror and unease. Modern digital culture has also led to the development of a whole new subgenre of horror known as analog horror that takes advantage of the negative stereotypes surrounding twins. One of the most popular analog horror theories, the Mandela Catalogs, lists doppelgangers as their main antagonist. The storyline goes that a rare species of otherworldly beings, also known as alternates, have inhabited the Earth. These alternates use elements of psychological warfare on humans in order to kill them, and as such, they must be exterminated before they end the human race. In this universe, having a twin will subsequently be a death sentence. The message buried in this series is that if you see someone who is identical to you, it means you are in danger. So today we have explored the historical and cultural aspects of twins that led to our current understanding of twinship, the psychology behind why twins experience isolation both internally and externally, and the negative connotations surrounding twins as a result of multimedia. Twins have been ostracized through the negative perceptions and horrific imagery shown frequently in the media. What do these representations say about the literature and multimedia that perpetuates the isolation of twins? Are we too obsessed with the negative psychological aspects? Representations of twins need to extend beyond these unfortunate tropes in order to improve individuality among persons within these otherizing relationships. The goal is to lessen the stigma associated with twins and their expectations in the relationship as well as within society. If more people acknowledge the reality of twinship and its harmful connotations, then there will be a likelihood for better representation of twins. Thank you. Pleasure, 
Lord Henry manages, manages to conquer during the United States and subscribe to the new Judaism ideology. Hazel Hallward is a painter who is enamored by the aesthetic value of Dorian's appearance. Generally considered to be Dorian's voice of conscience, Basil feared Dorian would be corrupted by Lord Henry's ideology. And in the center is our titular protagonist, Dorian Gray. Considering the moral influences they impart on Dorian, Lord Henry and Basil embody the good angel versus bad angel on the shoulder motif. With Lord Henry embodying the bad angel and Basil the good. The first doppelganger takes on the form of the portrait, which tracks the moral degradation of, of Dorian's soul as it progressively tarnishes the very beauty of Dorian values. This, this is usually where academic scholarship ends its discussions of doppelgangers in the novel. However, we identified yet another one that when considered in conjunction with the portrait, offers constitution, sorry, offers a more complex understanding, the mirror. Lord Henry's mirror is a absence, is a constant vision of Dorian's everlasting youth, irregardless of the abhorrent status of the painting that reinforces Dorian's fidelity to new hedonism. Each doppelganger was gifted to Dorian by two people in his life with rivaling moral values to embody the hell heaven binary of the shoulder angel motif, exemplified by Lord Henry and Basil. This draws upon the Faustian myth of a man who sold his soul to the devil for magical powers. So our research analyzes the concept of externalization. Oh, what? Sorry. <laughs> um, our research analyzes the concept of externalization beyond doppelgangers and isolation. Um, so to truly evaluate during Dorian's psychological reckoning, we must also consider the spaces the doppelgangers occupy. So as the portrait becomes more horrid and perverse in a way commensurate with Dorian's continuing sinful acts, he decides to hide the painting in his attic. We maintain that the attic acts as the house of the mind and how it contains the painting of Dorian as well as Henry's mirror. Dorian is seen frequently returning to the attic um, to view the painting and how it has changed based on his increasingly immoral actions. In fact, he delights in comparing the image he sees in the painting of his true self and the reflection he sees in the mirror of his external self. It is here in the attic that Dorian is able to engage in a dialogue with himself, including, perhaps not intentionally, confronting his actions and recognizing the inevitability of their consequences. Um, Dorian fears and hates the painting, and it is in the attic in which the painting can be accessed, the side of it challenging Dorian's previously aloof attitude towards his sins. Um, for our thesis, we argue that the attic is where Dorian stores the mirror and the portrait and, um, and how it acts as the setting where he externalizes his internal conflict um, into the outside space of the attic, um, acting as an intimate space where the actors of the mindscape are corporealized that enable Dorian to tangibly interact with the components of the psyche. Um, unlike Dorian's inanimate of the painting, um, the attic is a physical location, serving as a setting where internal, um, internal struggles sorry, eventually dissipate out into physicality. Um, thus, Dorian would divide between reality and fiction and ultimately embody Dorian's um, subconscious. To expound upon our thesis, we will now go into how the attic is representative of Dorian's structure and psyche. As the story progresses, the integrity of Dorian's subconscious slowly declines as he travels further into the humanistic lifestyle. In the scene of Basil's murder, Dorian seems to be coerced by the portrait, as you can see from the left quote on this slide. As he spends more time in the attic, viewing the deterioration of his portrait, Dorian's perception of his own identity and what his internal desires are blend with his fantasies. By hiding the portrait in the attic, the audience can view the decay of both the state of the portrait itself as well as Dorian's own mental state. When considering the anatomy of a house, common sense would dictate that since the attic is above ground, it would represent heaven, and since the basement is underground, it would represent hell. Wilde instead deviates from this and makes the attic the hell equivalent. He does this in order to preserve the space as a representation of Dorian's subconscious, as the brain occupies an elevated space atop, atop human shoulders. 
Also to highlight the discord between heavenly and hellish values at the root of Dorian's inner mental destruction. In this sense, the attic represents the root of, represents the spiritual ascendance of Dorian's soul, and to reach such an intimate understanding of his psyche in a close corporeal environment that is induced by this hellish destructive descent to meet it in it. So just to give an example of how the attic is utilized in Dorian Gray, we provided some images from the 2009 movie adaptation in which Dorian shows Basil the changes in his portrait. Before this scene, Basil arrives at Dorian's house, worried about Dorian and his recent behaviors. He expresses concerns that Dorian is not the same person he painted. At this moment, Dorian is undergoing a spiritual reckoning and is being asked to repent by Basil. Notice how Basil is surrounded by a divine-like aura of light to reinforce his role as Dorian's sense of compunction, basically the angel on the shoulder. Dorian, however, is too immersed in the hellish nature of new hedonism, hence why he looks at himself in the mirror given to him by Lord Henry, and proceeds to murder Basil, thus eliminating his moral conscience. This all occurs in the attic, the location of the clash between heavenly salvation and self-indulgent hell. how the attic also serves as a space for Dorian's self-destruction. Uh, so the attic serves as an instrumental role in the destruction of Dorian, most notably through its representation of his own cognitive self. Uh, while others might attribute this solely to the painting, we argue that the storage of the painting within the cognitive state of the attic allows the painting to absorb the identity that Dorian wishes to discard. The cognitive realm uh, of the attic has allowed certain cognitive features, such as guilt, uh, into physical items such as the knife. Uh, which he uses to uh, stab the portrait. In turn, the materialization of guilt uh, into the physical life allowed for Dorian to commit suicide, both in reality and in the cognitive realm, which in turn allowed for the portrait to return to her mouth. So we're about to say something quite scandalous, but please do not assume us to be Satanists just yet. Uh, just wait until the final uh, finale of the presentation, and you can make your own judgments. Uh, we assure you, we are not, in fact, Satanists. Uh, so, as we discussed, Lord Henry uh, has a beguiling charm and corrupt power reminiscent of the devil uh, that arrests Dorian's fancy. Uh, one can draw a direct correlation of his manipulative schemes to when Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge at Lucifer's connection, thus introducing sin to the Garden of Eden. In essence, both Lucifer and Lord Henry offer the subjects they seek to subjugate with a dark, hellish form of enlightenment by giving them a heightened sense of cognizance. Adam and Eve were stripped of their blissful ignorance and made aware of their surroundings, meanwhile Dorian uh, gained greater awareness of himself. These biblical elements are imbibed in the portrayal of the doppelgangers, which function as rightly corporealized values in the divine order and in Dorian's soul. The mirror is Lord Henry's sinful perverseness, which is hell, and the portrait encapsulates Basil's compunction and virtue. The attic, therefore, is a space doppelgangers inhabit and are in effect a space for Dorian to reach a Ramana like transcendence where he intimately peers into the composition of his soul. There, he is free to pursue his search to resolve the conflict between the combating values of hell and heaven that completely overrode his life and immerse him in evil. Though hell is usually depicted as subterranean, while it chooses to make it the attic as Lord Henry's influence is that catalyst that allows Dorian to quote unquote elevate his soul for true introspection to occur through an embodied experience.
turn and talk to one another <laughs> and come up with a question. You've got 20 seconds. like 
the normal twin, so there's something about them that makes them inferior, and because of that, they might want to kill the one that looks normal, or the one that is more socially acceptable, um, the one that looks more socially acceptable. So in a sense, it's similar to us, how um, the other group kind of is outcasted. They aren't able to experience the same things as the normal people in the world. And because of that, they want to almost kill the other one. They have this, I mean, I don't know if they're related, but you can compare it to what I said when it came to history, how fratricide is something that is seen a lot in twins, how if there's someone similar to you, related to you, and when it comes to twins, a trope used often in horror is the idea of fratricide, where you're going to kill your other sibling because there's some kind of sense of they're overlapping in my life, and I don't like that. And I want to live my own life, and I want to be separated from my sibling. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Round of applause. Everyone, have a good Saturday. Go back to front of the house. Thank you for coming. We'll see you soon.
For all seniors who are making us their own You're welcome to stay. Can we still give it to them? Last band but we're not allowed to have any aisles, any standing up. That's why I'm telling you to move back and solidify. Thank you. Because it's soon as kids see last band fun, like you guys there, then they don't go on their own and it's like five, six years. It's very hard to get back. Thank you. 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 Um, yes. so good. So, really and you take one. Thank you. The love the last row. Uh, last two rows. So you all got to move, you all got to move, move back. I want that whole row filled. And then we'll move to the second row. And then we're able to do it. Judges also, just fill up 50 seats in the front row, and then the other row. So you guys can move back. This is all open. And then we'll move to the second row. We'll have to move over or down. Then, so see you guys listen up. If you see people standing in the aisle, you gotta pick you out. But don't worry about it. I mean, really, you see everyone talking. So then, the TV out there playing the front. So you see the same one. So we might, you know, it's gonna be touching the wall all day. So just be prepared for us to be like, Leave. See you later. And then, um, I think that one, two, and eight are the most popular. So we might be good four or five, six, seven. We'll see them. All right, so juniors. You all in the front row stay. You all in the second row. I will fill in the front row and we'll the end of this row. How do you know? You're going to fill in first. Questions? Of course. Don't
So in our research, we decided to make the distinction between ethics and morals, which sometimes can get confused with each other. So for ethics, we decided that the definition was the legality of an action based on a set of rules or laws followed, and morals is defined as the abiding of one's personal or normative principles. And in doing so, we'll be able to determine whether their actions should be praised or condemned. For our thesis, we propose that Promethean rebel heroes, heroes should be praised within reason for their actions, despite the associated ethical conflicts. These conflicts also make Promethean rebel heroes outsiders because of their unorthodox approaches to various situations that society tends to look down on them for. What society fails to see, however, is that these individuals are a key part of societal advancement. As a result of their willingness to rebel against the norms, as seen with real life individuals such as Rosa Parks and Matt Turner. When it comes to evaluating an individual's controversial actions, some may say that their actions should be condemned because they are illegal or otherwise unethical. Yet, this is where morals come into play, possibly outweighing ethics at times. We implemented a literary criticism lens which allows us to focus on certain stylistic choices such as themes and plots. The literary criticism lens allows us to analyze the Promethean rebel hero archetype, their intentions and executions over their different courses of media, furthering the idea that this archetype is universal. So currently there is very limited scholarship surrounding the Promethean rebel hero archetype, and so there's the deviations of the hero archetype which would be superhero, and the deviations of that would be the outlaw hero archetype, with an example with being um, Robin Hood, and the modern hero archetype, which is um, can be exemplified with um, Harry Potter. And so those contain an abundance of scholarship, though none analyze the complexity of the like, hero's intentions, like the Prometheus hero, hero archetype that does. So it is essential to analyze the intentions of the Promethean rebel hero by discussing whether their actions and intentions were ethical or moral, respectively. Our anchor text is a thousand splendid sons by Khalid Hussaini, taking place in 1970s Afghanistan during the Soviet Afghan War and the first Taliban rule. Hussaini tells the story of two women, Maryam and Layla, who face domestic violence from their husband Rashid and try to escape it. Maryam is the main Promethean rebel hero in this novel, as seen in the following quote on the screen. Maryam knew then futility, maybe even the irresponsibility, of not punishing this. Had Maryam been certain that he, that he would be satisfied with shooting only her, that there would be a chance he would spare Layla, she might have dropped the shovel. But in Rashid's eyes, she saw murder for them both. And so Maryam raised the shovel high, and with that, she brought down the shovel. And this time, she gave it everything she had. Maryam killed Rashid because he was strangling Layla to death. She eventually went to jail and was sentenced to death for her actions. Though they are not ethical since they are technically illegal, they are based on her own morals, seeing that she is acting to protect herself and her family. Maryam's actions serve as a symbol of female defiance for oppression. By killing Rashid, Maryam sends a message to the women in her society that they don't have to submit to domestic violence. And this is how she moves her society forward. Your father had to find another way to save. Okay, so to support our anger text, we analyze Interstellar, which is a science fiction epic film by Christopher Nolan. And this film takes place in a future where planet Earth has slowly become uninhabitable due to dust storms and crop lights. So the Promethean rebel hero in this film is actually Professor Brand, who is the director and one of the scientists left at NASA who are working towards uh, finding a new habitable planet. As part of his plan to develop the larger mission, they're containing Plan A and Plan B. And Plan A, which included relocating everyone on Earth to the new planet that they would eventually discover, whereas Plan B would um, leave everyone behind on Earth and just send human embryos to essentially population bomb the new planet. And so now we've included a clip from the film where the astronauts later discover Professor Graham's true intentions from Dr. Man. The human race from extinction, and then the colony. Why keep putting those things in Because he knew how hard it would be to get people to work together to save the species instead of themselves. But their children, you never want to come here unless you believe you were going to save them. Evolution. 
illusion has yet to transcend that simple barrier. We, we can care deeply, selflessly about those we know, but that empathy rarely extends beyond our line of sight. So though Dr. Grant commits ethically wrong actions by keeping his intentions of pursuing Plan B all along as a secret from his colleagues and the public, it is morally just to do so as he would be saving essentially the entire human race as a species from extinction and would be acting for the greater good. Your father had to find enough. Our third source is The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which takes place in 1920s Long Island and focuses on the pursuit of Daisy Buchanan by Jay Gatsby. The Promethean rebel hero analyzed in this text is Jay Gatsby, who takes the blame for Myrtle Wilson's death that was caused by Daisy's car accident. Gatsby's love for Daisy motivates him to take the blame for Myrtle's accident, making him the Promethean rebel hero. Gatsby says, of course, I'll say I was. You see, when we left New York, she was very nervous and she thought it was steady for to drive. And this woman rushed out at us. It all happened in a minute. Well, first, Daisy turned away from the woman toward the other car, and then she lost her nerve and turned back. The second my hand reached the wheel, we, wheel I felt the shock. <clears throat> As evident in the quote, Gatsby is quick to take the blame for Daisy, and he is essentially willing to cover up the murder of an innocent woman so that he can um, protect Daisy. Although Gatsby's actions might not have been ethical, he was acting out of his own morals for Daisy's sake. Additionally, Gatsby's sacrifice helps advance his friend Nick Carraway's perspective on wealth, who learns from him that wealth corrupts. After learning about what Gatsby sacrificed for, Day uh, for Daisy, Nick is disappointed and angered at the, fact, uh, at the fact of learning that Daisy didn't even care to come to his funeral. In his realization, he says, they were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their money or their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the messes they had made. No, you my dad. <laughs> so for our last one, is Happy New Year, which is a comedic Bollywood film directed by Farah Khan. So the basis of the film revolves around Charlie, our Promethean rebel hero, who plans a diamond heist in order to avenge his father, Manahor, and retrieve stolen diamonds that were stolen from Sharon. So Sharon's actions are revealed in this video. <laughs> First off, 
we'll be discussing stereotypes. With the rich being the top 1% of the population, opinions surrounding this exclusive class in society are often dismissive, and affluent individuals are commonly labeled as condescending. This is displayed in the 2018 film, Crazy Rich Asians. Rachel Chu, an economics professor living a normal life in New York City, meets the mother of her extremely wealthy boyfriend, Nick Young, for the first time. Nick's mother's disapproving and unwelcoming attitude towards Rachel based on her socioeconomic background paints the rich class as cold and unsympathetic due to an existing inner security complex. However, the causes of prejudice and stereotypes is not limited to media coverage alone. The media more so amplifies prejudice that already exists, and the two underlying principles that provide an explanation for these hostile feelings are the theory of relative deprivation, money and influence, along with cognitive dissonance. Referring to the chart, popular attitudes towards wealthy people are created on the grounds of two major aspects, warmth and competence. As you can see, the highest levels of competence and the lowest levels in warmth are attributed to the rich class simultaneously, which ultimately results in envy. When social groups view other groups as economically more successful, their members are more likely to develop compensation strategies to maintain their own self-esteem. Thus, members of higher and lower social class innately accept different criteria for societal rankings that places them at the top of the hierarchy. The psychology of envy is reflected in two of our texts, The Swans of Fifth Avenue and The Age of Innocence. In both texts, the external outsiders, Truman Capote and Countess Ellen Alenska, are both not accepted by the members of the rich elite circle, yet they still deeply admire the way these rich individuals present themselves in conformity with the traditions and customs of old wealth. However, they ultimately come to a realization that being born with a silver spoon comes with a price.
the work next thread, I'll be talking about duty versus desire and the struggles between family and love. So, how to love. People of the rich class tend to love differently than the rest of society. They lack the capability of gaining a deeper level of emotional love with their significant other. On the left here, we have Babe Bailey and Bill Paley from the novel The Swan of the Dead Family. Throughout the novel, there has been many occurrences that appear that demonstrate how their relationship only stays together because of their money. On the right, we have Denise Lombardo and Jordan Belfort from the movie The Wolf of Wall Street. Throughout the movie, it has shown where Jordan Belfort commits cheating against his wife with another woman, and which leads to their divorce a few days later. This basically shows that those with extreme wealth tend to lack the emotion of love. They feel a sense of superiority with the wealth they possess, causing them to make selfish decisions. Moving on to traditions and reputation, here you can see a quote from the book The Age of Innocence. This is spoken by Newman Archer. He's essentially trapped in this passionless, passion, passionless marriage with his wife because of the reputation his family would gain. Instead of loving who you love, the rich tend to enforce these traditions on themselves, which limit their own freedom in order to satisfy the rest of society. This then ties into old world versus new world. On the screen here, we have two pictures from the film Crazy Rich Asians. On the left, we have the young family, and on the right, we have the girl family. The young family represents old world as they have money passed down from generations to generations. They value their reputation as throughout the film, they showed great concern and curiosity when finding out their son was seeing a girl that was outside of their social circle. The girl family, on the other hand, represents new all, since they worked their way up to the position they're in. They were really accepting of Rachel, who was seen as a commoner during the time. This shows that those with old wealth tend to be mentally conditioned to follow certain values, because that's how they were taught, and that's how money made them. And now moving on to the last field of study, psychology. Does money bring happiness? For society's small group of upper elites, the answer to that question is no, not necessarily. In The Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort is the sight of humanity and is so obsessed with the process of wanting more that he becomes so overbearing and is willing to resort to any means, including fraudulence and scamming, to continue gaining wealth. Because of the wealthy's desire for more, they are unable to reach self-fulfillment. And as a means of coping with the mental strain and dissatisfaction of their lives, many upper elites utilize drugs, abuse substances, and are involved in adultery, deceit, betrayal, and promiscuity in order to drown out their feelings of sadness. A study conducted from Columbia University found that Americans are twice as rich and no happier. Depression rates have soared. The more people strive for ex extrinsic goals, such as money, the more numerous their problems and less robust their well-being. In the Swan of Fifth Avenue, the author highlights Babe Paley's inability to confide with anyone about their true feelings. In the process of appeasing a larger group, Babe had gotten so accustomed to living behind a mask that no one, including her, could distinguish between her facade and her true self, full of sorrow and misery. The escape theory describes how people choose to free themselves from aversive instances of self-awareness. Materialism is often associated with impulsive behavior patterns, so many attempt to embrace or design a new version of themselves through material spending. And a prime example from the Crazy Rich Asians is when Astrid spent millions of dollars on a pair of earrings just for pleasure. When wealthy individuals are dissatisfied with their lives, they often channel their vulnerability into materialism to suppress these negative feelings. And in other cases, self-isolation is another method of escaping from reality, especially for Newland Archer from The Age of Innocence, as he seems to be the only one amongst his family and friends who believes his life is dull and bleak. And so Archer's emotional and psychological separation from this reality forces him to become the outsider amongst his people. This isolation from one's society also leads to an emotional disconnection from others, forcing wealthy individuals to lose compassion and feelings of empathy thus making it more difficult to connect with people on deeper emotional levels. Thank you.
Great. So now we have some time for questions from the crowd. So yeah, all right, right here. I have a question for the first group. Could you define like the um, definitions or like the difference between legality and like I think it was like morality and uh, uh, like the, the other one I forgot to mention. Yeah. Um, so ethics and morals. That's what we were trying to distinguish between because like um, oftentimes it's kind of mixed up and you kind of use them interchangeably but in our research we kind of wanted to emphasize the I guess the difference between the two and in a sense ethics focuses more on how legal something is based on like the laws so for example like um, know, murder is like like I mentioned is not ethical obviously but um, Morals is based on your own personal values, whether that be like based on you know religion, like whatever influences your um, morals. So it's kind of uh, intrinsic and it's kind of personal. It's also based on you know like um, normative beliefs. So it's kind of just laws versus your own beliefs. Yeah, and like specifically dealing with morals, we kind of focused on whether that character was acting out of love for someone else. So if that love was there, then we considered their actions to be moral, even if they weren't ethical. All right, and do we have another question from the crowd?
Hi, I wanted to provide some comparison that you have between new wealth and old wealth. So do you believe that the Go family also had, like, to an extent, like the same kind of otherness that the Young family felt due to their wealth? Or do you believe that their new wealth makes them, in a way, exempt from that feeling? I think in a way, um, well, from the show, it seemed that they were really welcoming of Rachel, who at, in their society seemed as a commoner. So I feel like as someone who worked off their way into wealth, they have more of a perspective of how those who aren't as wealthy are like. So they have more of a basis to relate on. Um, I can add a little bit more to that. So our being kind of focused at the rich people are kind of self-imposing these ideals of isolationism to the point where they become known to, um, to how other people feel and what their feelings entail. So we chose not to focus on the newer wealth generations because they already have these feelings and that ability to have an emotional connect with other people. So that's kind of more exclusive to people who enjoy generational wealth. Thank you. All right, so another round of applause for both of you.
or a girl like him versus one other person who will kill the old person. Maybe they have to do that. It depends on life. Things like that. Yeah. 
sort of the, uh, the hanging tree.
nice to see. You get a high standard. You to see what all they are. So regardless of what they, how they look at it, they used to respond to the Second 
presentation today to immediately follow that one will be by Jennifer Kesey, Elaine King, Gabriella Kishby, and Noshin Simone. And their presentation is entitled, The Unspoken Narrative, A Focus on Women and the Symbolism of the Butterfly. Um, so without further ado, I would like to turn it over to our first presenters. Hello everyone, welcome to this year's Humanity Symposium. Um, this is our presentation entitled Good Bad Girls Examining the Influence of Mary Magdalene on Things Time of the Butterfly. So our thesis text is titled In the Time of the Butterfly, written by Julia Alvarez, and it follows the lives of Minerva, Maria Teresa, Francia, and Dede Mirabal, four sisters who grew up in the Dominican Republic during the dictatorship of Rafael Trujillo. Minerva, Maria Teresa, and Papia's experiences inspire them to lead a rebellion against the government, earning them the code name Las Mariposas, or the Butterflies. As the rebellion progresses, Maria Teresa and Minerva are imprisoned and eventually released along with other female political prisoners to house arrest. Ultimately, the sisters are all assassinated by Trujillo for their defiance, barring Dede, who survives to the present day as the sole bearer of the story of the legendary miracle. In present time, she struggles to balance her sister's popular mythologization with the memories of the genuine miracles that only she remembers best. So to start our analysis of the novel, we're going to look at how Alvarez frames Mary Magdalene through a contrast between the two personas that define how women are perceived. So to make this distinction clear, we have two songs here from the construct of Notre Dame. In Heaven's Light, Cosimodo sings about his love for Esmeralda and his hope that she reciprocates it. And in Hellfire, Paulo laments about his conflicting lust and hatred for Esmeralda and her Romani identity. So we're going to play parts of both of these songs now. <laughs> On the other hand, women without the strings, especially the sexually liberated, 
fall into the latter category, falsely characterized as faithless and dirty. As Kenny Kennedy explains, the church attaches female sexuality to notions of evil repentance and mercy, removing agency and power from the individual woman. Conveniently, this perception overshadows Magdalene's accomplishments as an honored female disciple and amongst the few whose religious faith persevered post Jesus' crucifixion. With that being said, our argument seeks to examine these bad women. Characters within our thesis text, such as Magdalena or Lena Lovaton, who fails to meet the cultural expect expectations imposed on women, are unjustly vilified. Even our otherwise kind and revolutionary protagonists fall victim to course in these standards. Alvarez reveals the nuance in these so called sinners by dismantling the dichotomy present within human sexuality, and especially for us, it's her goal to emphasize morality as independent from sex sexuality. So, so, to examine Alvarez's subversion of this dichotomy between the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene, we decided to focus on the character Magdalena, who not only carries the name Magdalene, but also whose portrayal is a clear example of Alvarez's attempt to convey the injustice of categorizing women as simply good or bad. So who is Magdalena? Magdalena is one of the women that the Mirabals meet while incarcerated. She is depicted as a sort of resident mother in the prison. She looks after the other women, giving away the few small luxuries she is afforded, such as sugar or bobby pins. In her diary entry, Maria Teresa describes Magdalena as the easiest to be with, a confidant who comforts her in the same way that her own mother used to. Additionally, after Maria Teresa is tortured by the sin to manipulate her husband into giving up information about his associates within the revolution, Magdalena, who is the only other person Maria Teresa tells about the trauma, treats her injuries. In the text, Maria Teresa uses the words nursing me to describe Magdalena's health, which once again only further emphasizes the role that Magdalena played in the prison and the effect that she had on Maria Teresa. When Magdalena is first introduced, we see her as a motherly figure, a caretaker for the other women she is incarcerated with, and are left wondering why exactly a woman with characteristically good traits has been shunned by society. Eventually, we learn of her tragic backstory. Magdalena worked in the home of a wealthy family and was repeatedly assaulted by the young man at the home. The family accused her of being ungrateful and lying and threw her out on the street. She lived with her daughter on the streets for years when eventually her rapist family decided that they wanted to lay claim to her child and took her away. In an attempt to get her daughter back, Magdalena went to the family's home and pulled out a knife. She later tells Maria Teresa, I got 20 years for attempted murder. When I get out, my little girl will be my age when I came in. So the reason that we are focusing on Magdalena specifically is not just because of her similar her name, but also because she and Magdalene um, share a contrast between their true selves and their public image. They are characterized as compassionate and loyal people, but they are perceived by others as quote unquote dirty sinners who must repent or be punished. The reason for this contrast is because of the, the traits they exhibit which are considered bad for women. Um, Magdalene is independent and unmarried, and Magdalena is poor, queer, a rape victim, the mother of male and the child, etc. So these two characters are so important because um, the, their character could potentially be, um, serve as an inspiration to other women by demonstrating that um, good the traits and the bad traits are not exactly um, mutually exclusive, that someone can, that a woman can be a good person while also having these non-standard characteristics. Um, therefore, they threaten the binary between these two kinds of women by demonstrating its unfairness and arbitrary nature. So they are rewritten as entirely wicked, and the potential lessons that they could teach are turned into harmful ones. Magdalene becomes a repentant prostitute who teaches that sexual women are sinners who need to atone for their sexuality in order to become righteous. And Magdalena is turned into an ungrateful liar and a dangerous criminal to teach that rape victims are liars and threats. Alvarez presents characters like Magdalena and other outcast women as being punished by society for their quote unquote sins, especially related to sex and conception. Through the nuances of their actual stories, she asserts that women who are labeled as wicked are in fact more likely to be victims of an unfair system designed to keep women in line and pit them against each other instead of the men who oppress them. 
patriarchal society presents women with two possibilities for what they can be, controlled and quote unquote good, or not standard and quote unquote bad, but Alvarez encourages her audience to look beyond this binary and examine the injustices behind why certain women are made the outsiders. In doing so, she presents the revolutionary idea that quote unquote bad girls can be heroines and positive role models. That Mary Magdalene should be able to stand as an equal to the Virgin Mary for who she really is, but who she is known as now. And we are Thriving of a butterfly 
Butterflies can still start, serve as a symbol of detriment. While some argue that butterflies are representative of freedom, we argue that the butterfly is symbolic of the oppression of the patriarchy, which prevents women from obtaining closure or, in other words, a sense of freedom, while men do receive such privileges. To understand the meaning of the butterfly, it is important to analyze the status of women in 100 years of solitude. For some background, this novel follows seven generations of the Wendia family headed by Jose and Ursula. When Jose passes away, Ursula takes charge of Macondo. She alters customs and religious practices, yet at the end of the day, returns to her husband tied to the chestnut tree to weep her sorrows and review her decisions as seen through the gold above. Consequently, Ursula has the ability to greatly influence many aspects of the society, and there exists this idea of a matriarchy. However, the matriarchy is an illusion because Ursula continues to depend on a man, Jose, to console her and validate her decisions. So we see here the idea of the man behind the matriarchy. Ultimately, as powerful as Ursula may be, she fails to uphold her status and continues to succumb to Jose, who is ironically the cause of her problems. As a result, we see how women have internalized a sense of impotence as a result of being controlled and thus oppressed by a male figure, in this case, Jose. Having established the aforementioned, we will move forward and draw a connection between butterflies and oppression. As we mentioned previously, the butterfly is associated with closure. This closure is exclusively present for men throughout the novel, since yellow butterflies, as described by Giovanni and the day Mabata, about to explode, are associated with transformation and rebirth, which we will consider a form of closure, which appears slowly, closures, which appears slowly during the death of a man. In the following quote, Mauricio courts Memet, a relationship with Memet's mother, Bernarda opposes and ends by accusing Mauricio of theft, death, which leads to his death. When Mauricio dies, butterflies surround him and are described as haunting objects. While this may initially contradict the idea that butterflies only exist in a novel to give men closure, as we discussed previously because of their dark meaning, it doesn't because the mere presence of the butterflies during Mauricio's death confirms that closure is an option for men. The dark association of the butterfly alludes to the idea that outside forces like Fernanda of women have prevented Mauricio from obtaining his rebirth in peace when she broke the relationship. Therefore, butterflies that take on a haunting meaning reflect how society seeks to villainize women who have successfully countered men's desires to shun and therefore oppress women, which in, prevent, which in turn prevents their closure. To continue on our adventure through Latin America-based texts, we analyzed the intent of the butterflies by Julia Alvarez, which is a historical fiction based on the true story of the four Mirabel sisters who fought for freedom during Rafael Trujillo's regime in the Dominican Republic. In this quote, the mariposas, aka butterflies, represents all the oppressed citizens being tortured by Trujillo's raging, so they helped many cheer for their courage. Alvarez compares their screams to Minerva's wings, which help her fly. Their autonomy, where they stand their ground and use their voices to battle Trujillo's raging. According to Mikhail Foucault, the body's politics are a collection of material elements and techniques used as weapons, relays, communication routes, and supports to imbue human bodies with power and knowledge while subjugating those bodies to the transformation of knowledge objects. According to Foucault, this restriction has little effect on butterfly populations, which we deem as women in society. The author uses the female body as a form of expression, using the name of the mariposas that translates to the butterflies. This refers to the lack of ownership that women in society have over their autonomy. Physicality gives and takes life in Alvarez's text. The butterfly motif reflects Alvarez's feminism in her writing. Minerva's mind-body connection boosts her sister's courage and heroism. Overall, in the times of the butterflies, lacks a progressive anti-cyclical trauma cycle, where women can heal. Trujillo gets away with killing the Mirabel sisters, and it takes another assassination by a man to end his raging. This shows the greater power men have in Latin American societies, where three women who sacrificed their lives to fight a totalitarian raging failed because of their femininity. At the same time, their movement proves that women must work harder than men to have their voices heard and acknowledged. The butterfly symbol continues to represent oppression because the Mirabel sisters were butterflies, trapped by Trujillo's patriarchy, despite gaining autonomy, by speaking up and pursuing their desires despite men's harsh attitudes. Ultimately, whereas the butterflies in 100 years of solitude showed a man's closure and villainization as a way to oppress women. 
The butterflies here show the limitations of the psychic symbol when applied to women in closure. It shows that women are capable of becoming the Mirabel sisters and standing up for themselves to obtain the closure they need from the injustices committed by Trujillo. In essence, while there is progression in the assertiveness of women in their closure, they continue to lack freedom because they were unable to succeed in their endeavors in killing Trujillo without the intervention of men. As a result, the butterfly continues to symbolize the patriarchy and its oppressive forces. And so we come to Encanto. Looking at these three works in comparison to each other, we see the progression of women's autonomy where they're shown to have more liberties in media today compared to past literature like 100 Years of Solitude and In the Time of the Butterflies. What we're looking at with Encanto is the authenticity of this progression, as Disney wants to show things like women empowerment and positive femininity, which is why in Encanto they have characters like Luisa and how the family structure itself showcase a matriarchy. The butterflies, then, could be said to be a symbol of this matriarchy and the progression of women's autonomy. After all, they're everywhere in the movie, on the candle, on Mirabelle's dress, on the walls of the house. It appears <coughs> that these butterflies belong to the women. Looking at it deeper, though, with two scenes in particular, we actually see the opposite. The butterflies come from a man and are symbolic of how women and cannot escape the patriarchy. In the scene on the left, where the magical candle first appears, it is portrayed in the movie as a gift to Abuela. But who gave her that gift? It was her husband's death that granted her and her children power and security. So it wasn't the woman at all, but the man's sacrifice that allowed the family to be a matriarchy in the first place. In the ending scene on the right, where Abuela and Mirabel reconcile, Abuela states, I asked my Pedro for help. Mirabel, he sent me you. Abuela attributes Mirabel's accomplishments to her <coughs> husband and connects her back to him. And once again, we have the man behind the matriarchy. Therefore, the butterflies are not a symbol of the freedom that women have with their autonomy and independence, but rather the lack of freedom that women have in succumbing to the patriarchy. And so, through our analyses, we've pinpointed the recurrence of one symbol, the butterfly, which has contributed heavily to these works and its underlying meanings associated with gender. Thus, we come to a better comprehension of the patriarchy and reasons for its persistence to define the progression that has truly occurred for women, the outsiders of our society, and more importantly, bring attention to the progression that still needs to happen for women to escape this entrapment. Thank you.
um, inmates who are like also outcasts by virtue of being prisoners. Um, Dominican society as a whole views her as a villain. Um, like the, the family, like when she tried to take back her child by threatening her former boss, she was as a charge with attempted murder and thrown into prison, even though um, she was doing good action because she was trying to rescue her child from, from uh, people who had stolen in her. So basically, the um, point we're making is that like, even though she is doing these good actions by like, trying to be a good mother and standing up to the family of the rapist, um, she is condemned by society. We can hear you.
engineering and outsiders. We have the two groups. Uh, first group, um, I'll take off my glasses. Kim Chi and its cultural role in the delicate dynamic between outsiders and societal pressures in Pachinko. The group is Ryan Eng, Alyssa Figueroa, Dylan Pelovec, and Amelia. Sorry. <laughs> Um, the second group is the Spice of Life, food as a uniting and isolating force in literature, with Ethan El Bravo, Josue Castellanco, Carolina Zemniak, and Sarah Ardeo. So our first group of study Japanese street market as the central focus point of the scene, where many underlying themes are present as well, all of which are tied together to the food in which she is selling, kimchi. Our following slides will delve into the themes presented here, so make sure to keep these clips in mind. So, in our research, we gathered various literary analysis of novels where food was significant, but we weren't able to find one that addresses the relationship between food and Korean diaspora. This is due to the novelty of Pachinko, and thus the scholarly work on the novel itself is very limited. However, we did find that food can be linked to both cultural divisions as well as challenges and resistances regarding the legitimacy of certain identities. Within the narrative of Pachinko, we found that kimchi is representative of these embedded messages, specifically in regard to gender and culture. The role the dish plays within the novel illustrates that there is no overcoming or fully resisting social societal barriers. Instead, one must endure and try their best to climb the social ladder. And this brings us to our thesis. We are arguing that the usage of kimchi within Pachinko is representative of the perpetual outsider status the Bayek family faces, despite their efforts to assimilate into Japanese society. It has ties to the violence of foreign smells, the resilience of women, and the preservation of culture. Now that we've established some context, we will shift our attention towards analyzing the specific usage of kimchi in the novel Pachinko. All right, 
So let's think back to the two clips that we saw in the beginning of the presentation. First, however, we need to go over some of the more some more context to understand the significance of it. So Yosef has forbidden his wife Kyung Ki from getting a job, even though his salary is not enough to support the family. Her role is to take care of the household chores. Kyung Ki has voiced to Senja that her dream is to open up a kimchi stall, but can never afford to do it on her own. Just before this scene, Senja's husband Isak was jailed for not renouncing Christianity in place of Shintoism, the main religion of Japan at the time. So now the scene of the novel itself. There are three main parts that we'll be examining in the next few minutes. So women and how women in pachinko utilize kimchi to resist societal norms and misogyny. We have foreign smells and how kimchi's strong order odor parallels the immigrant experiences as highlighted throughout the novel, and we have cultural acceptance and how kimchi gauges both immigrant integration and nativist resistance. So before, del before delving into how kimchi reflects resilience amongst women, we'll examine the specific word disobedience. So the first mention of disobedience was used to refer to a resistance against the government. This action in and of itself, even though it was considered disobedience, was also considered heroic. Paradoxically, with the negative consequences, it brought upon the Bayek family. So this included the imprisonment of Sinja's husband, which brought upon a greater financial insecurity for the family. So Kyungki and Sinja's plan were to alleviate the family's problems by opening a kimchi cart, which the second quote portrays that they were able to do so as a result of their disobedience against Sinja's brother-in-law and the breadwinner of the family. So this was referenced as so because of the way their actions interfered with the male ego. The second quote demonstrates, demonstrates a negative connotation of the word, which portrays the double standard that women had to face at the time. However, to Sinja and Kim Ki, kimchi and their kimchi cart acts as their savior, as they are able to find refuge in it and fight their financial instability in their current household while unabashedly portraying that they can do so as women. So before I go into this excerpt from the scene, I want to dive into this idea of smells having um, sort of invasive properties. When we interact with smells, there comes a lack of consent with this interaction because you never really mean to smell a foul odor, but since there's no way of detecting its presence until you've actually, already, you've actually already breathed it in and processed it, it feels like our noses are always vulnerable to this sort of attack by smells. So within this quote, we see that this, the stench of kimchi was so overwhelmingly disruptive within the marketplace that even vendors selling pungent foods, like Sinja, determined that Sinja's kimchi cart would be a threat to their business because of its foul odor. Lee in this quote makes it clear makes it clear that the stench of kimchi is not something that, will, that can be ignored. So her narrative and what she's trying to portray here is deepened when you tie these invasive properties of smell to the xenophobic ideas that people use to um, demonize immigrants. Think about the intrusiveness of smell, the violence of smell, and then parallel that to the way that immigrants are viewed as more inclined to commit crimes or viewed as job stealers and resource stealers from a country's people. Much like the foreign scent that accompanies them when they embrace their culture through culinary practices, um, immigrants themselves are resented for settling in areas where the people there never consented to welcoming them, even though that's a ridiculous notion because when immigrants go to a new country, they have the right to the same opportunities and overall better lifestyle that they're seeking that the people who were born there experience. Okay, um, thank you, Alyssa. So in our, the next thing we're gonna analyze you know, just as Amelia and Alyssa effectively dissected this one scene to really illustrate how kimchi serves as an effective way to understand the divisions and the cultural barriers, I'm going to do it specifically with uh, cultural acceptance. And in this scene, it's really significant because as you look at it, it's really the first time that Suda is able to find solace in Japan. So if we're going, looking at the context of the scene, Suja really just got as a book is found and mortified by the bystanders and the looks that they glanced at her as they walked by. And now in addition to that, you had the street vendors who also treated her really badly and really just reminded her of her isolation in Japan. But in this scene specifically, 
the butcher is such a significant part of the story because if you look at it further, it really connects to Sunja's subjectivity herself. Because as someone who works with kind of things with an odor and things that are associated with Japanese as being uncleansed, um, unsanitary, um, the butcher is too associated with these ideas. And what's furthers it even more is that a butcher works with meat. And Sinja's son, earlier in the novel, was associated with meat too. He was, uh, he was placed with the students in the class whose parents worked with animals, thus really illustrating the connection that these two groups have, and perhaps why the butcher is able to accept Sunja for her agency and really acknowledge her for who she is. So really looking through this whole presentation, it's clear that kimchi is a really pivotal part of pachinko. Uh, in truth, it only appears sparingly. Like it only appears five times throughout a 500-page novel. But in each point, you can really uh, analyze it and tell how it's really significant in illustrating the cultural barriers that exist. So we examine three main points, women, and how it really illustrates their resilience throughout the times, but also against the societal pressures that are created by that specific symbol. And then we also analyze smells and how those scents are also associated with certain connotations. And finally, how it contributes to cultural barriers. So, Kimchi is the forefront of the Baye's family's success and struggles throughout Japan. And it's also representative of the fact that complete social mobility isn't quite possible. But through it, the family endures and they uh, adhere to Kimchi throughout the novel. And I think that's just uh, representative of their resistance. And it's fitting that uh, Min Jin Lee chose this as a symbol because obviously kimchi is commonly recognized as a Korean food. I think that also applies to our perceptions. So it's really fitting and it serves as an effective way of illustrating the dynamics that exist with the Korean diaspora. Um, thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah. Thank you. 
components come together and in our brains to make a subjective food experience. And although they are, our experience of food is subjective, this does not mean that food cannot be used as a vehicle to convey emotion uh, and meaning to others. This notion is shared by Sim uh, Dr. Simona Stano, who writes that food has progressively emerged as a system of communication, a body of images, a protocol of usages, situations, and behavior, as well as a code expressing cultural identity. So food influences our identities, uh, not only on a biological level in terms of our brain function, but also on a social and psychological level in terms of how culture shapes the way we perceive and experience and understand food. talking about our first uh, main text. Um, so Like Water for Chocolate is a, a novel uh, and cookbook depicting the liberation of a young heroine named Tita through the power of food. Um, the book follows her life as she meets her true love, Pedro, uh, but has to see him marry her sister as her mother believes that the youngest daughter in the family should remain unmarried and take care of the mother until the mother's death. Um, so while Tita does not agree with this notion, uh, she's too respectful to say anything in disagreement with her mother. Um, and because of this, the only out for Tita's emotions is through her food. Um, so in the book, Tita uses food to defy her mother and express her love for Pedro. Um, the author writes, uh, with just a look, Mama Elena sent Tita away to get rid of the roses. She had to think fast what to do with them. They were beautiful, she couldn't just throw them in the trash. All at once, she seemed to hear Nacho's voice dictating a recipe pre-Hispanic recipe involving rose petals. This quotation demonstrates Tita disregarding Mama Elena's stern orders to get rid of the present from Pedro as he was set to wed her sister. However, in one of Tita's first act of defiance, she chooses to incorporate the flowers into a meal, showing that she's beginning to take the first steps to, take, to break free of the restraints of her mother. For Rosura and Pedro's wedding, Tita is, asked, uh, is tasked with creating the soon-to-be couple's wedding cake. Um, she, uh, in the book, um, sorry, <laughs> um, the moment, uh, however, the moment the guests took their first bite of the cake, everyone was flooded with a great wave of longing. Rosura Retching abandoned her place of honor. Even Pedro, usually so proper, was having trouble holding back his tears. Mama Elena, who hadn't shed a single tear over her husband's death, had trouble, um, was sobbing silently. An acute attack of pain and frustration seized the guests and left all of them wailing over lost love. Everyone there, every last person, fell under this spell. The only person that escaped was Tita. While Mama Elena is convinced that Tita poisoned the cake to sabotage the wedding, it turns out that the only extra ingredient Tita added was the tears she shed while preparing it. It's clear that the emotions the guests are experiencing are those that Tita felt while preparing the cake. She couldn't let anyone know of the feelings she was experiencing, not Rosura, not Pedro, and definitely not Mama Elena. So food ended up becoming the only form of expression she had. That's why throughout the book, we see food used as a way for Tita to rebel against her mother and express her suppressed emotions, as evidenced by the food's power, um, by the ability of her emotions to show themselves uh, through the characters that eat her food. So the novel Pomegranate Soup by Marcia Murren explores the lives of the Iranian almond poor sisters as they navigate love, familiar relations, and societal constructs in an Irish village. When Marjan, Bahar, and Layla moved to this new village, they faced intolerance due to their culture. The women worked together in a bakery to make a living for themselves as they battle constant judgment from the Irish natives. The subjectivity of food is shown in this novel as characters have differing opinions on what qualifies as good food. This is seen through the quote, would you like to come in? I'm making balklava. Can you smell the happiness? We see here the character Estelle appreciates a Persian dessert, and she clearly has a positive relationship with the dish. Estelle's own subjective experience with this dish leads her to associate it with a feeling of content, which demonstrates how one's own personal experience with food affects the emotions and taste it is associated with. However, the character Thomas has a completely opposite reaction to the balklava, which can be seen in the lines, but rather than have a similar amorous effect on Thomas, the scent tied his bowels into a disturbed knot. There was something very wrong about a smell so strong. Thomas's subjective experience with this dessert is negative as it is different from dishes that he's eaten before and it contrasts with his norm. 
This demonstrates how an individual's subjective experience with food can depend on how novel the dish is to them and their own ideas of what constitutes as enjoyable food. Research shows that people often assume that their way of eating is the only acceptable way and anything else is inferior. This is seen in the lines, sometimes we have naively assumed that this is the only way or the only good way to eat. Both Estelle and Thomas's contradictory reactions to the baklava exemplify this idea. Thomas's biblical reaction to the dish is based on his own taste and opinion, but calling it wrong isn't justified because it perpetuates the idea that culturally different foods are unacceptable. Liberation through food is another idea present within the novel. The text states, Marjan turned away from the stove and exhaled. The lightness of her surrender carried her up the stairs into an afternoon sleep that had been a long time coming. And behind Marjan, left bubbling on the stove for the very first time, was the unattended pot of pomegranate soup. Marjan, the oldest of the Amanpour sisters, acts as the maternal figure and is responsible for their well-being. By prioritizing herself over making the soup, She's liberating herself from the clutches of familial duty. Cooking has served as a way that Marjan provides for her family. And by turning away from this, she's able to succumb to herself and it signals the beginning of self-fulfillment. So the film that, the film The Underfoot Journey follows the story of the Brown family as they leave India for friends and open a traditional Indian restaurant. Nissan Mumbai, across the street from a Michelin star eatery, a uh, French eatery. The two restaurants soon enter a rivalry as they compete for the best ingredients. The protagonist, um, a talented chef called uh, named Hassan Kadam, is unafraid to use ingredients that he is unaccustomed to, and, oh, sorry, and he tells his brother, uh, just right before Nissan Mumbai's grand opening, Mansoor, to survive here, we're going to need to adapt have to make use of what is close to us. Um, in, in contrast, Hassan's father, Hassan's father seems to believe that changing the way you cook is almost as if you're changing who you are. This is shown by his insistence that Indian cannot become French and the French cannot become Indian. Uh, however, Hassan, Hassan ignores this, he ignores his father, and he sets out to Work at the French restaurant across the street to grow his business. This is the scene from that part of the movie. This is Fever that is fighting against the chicken. I added some spices for flavor and sauce. Coriander, garnish, and Christmas. But why change a recipe that is 200 years old? Because, madam, maybe 200 years is long enough.
with food that we have allows us to realize our own identities. Through the use of food, one can simultaneously critique and admire traditions in relation to their own personal views in ways that other forms of dialogue cannot. Food gives one the opportunity to empower themselves and distinguish themselves as individuals in society. Thank you.
asking about like if there was any connection with um, Tita's gender and her like emotions being represented by the food. Um, yeah, so we did notice that in that novel, it was um, pretty much only women that um, kind of dealt with food. So Tita actually had a mentor named Nacha, and so we really saw it most prevalent through her that her gender and her um, ethnicity um, played the largest role in her being um, sort of like a servant and having to cook for the whole family. And then she did take Tita under her wing. You know, Tita came from a family of only women, but nonetheless, like in the whole book, yeah, it is it is uh, pretty much women who um, cook and who show their emotions through the food. Um, men don't really um, like show their emotions that much in that novel. Last second. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.
gotta make sure that the uh clock is run and the SD So tomorrow, are there so many? Yes. Oh, Susanna Kowalski, Isabella Sicilian, and Victoria Schemborg. 
And our second presentation is entitled A Women and Intergenerational Trauma, Salty Stories of Political Unrest. And that will be presented by Samaria Kelly, Alisa Sayed, and Michaela Volpe. So please welcome our presenters and enjoy. Hi everyone, good afternoon. This is going to be our presentation on food, motherhood, and the third space in interpreter of realities by Jeff Lickery. But before we begin, I'd like to play a short clip, uh, which for context is basically just about this magic family with each member having special powers. This clip is going to be about Julia from Montreal, and you'll see here what her power is. Provider 
opens new avenues for establishing an empowering identity, which is oftentimes overlooked due to the prevalence of patriarchal values within the South Asian diaspora. Taking a look at this quote specifically, we see, in reference to Mrs. Sen, at times she sat cross-legged, at times with legs splayed, surrounded by an array of colanders and shallow bowls of water in which she immersed her chopped ingredients. I'm gonna stop right there. Taking a look at the word surrounded, it's bolded for a reason. We see that this is a repetitive nature for Mrs. Sens, as it allows herself to immerse herself within her nation, building her own type of space, a third space. This, you know, one thing to mention about this is that she's in her living room doing this. This is not the kitchen, which seems kind of unorthodox. But we see that in America, the living room is a place of, it's a common place. It's where we all hang out. For her, this is the place where she can immerse herself in, and which deems it the third space. As we continue, nevertheless, she refused to let Elliot walk around when she was chopping up foods. We see that Elliot is the child that she takes care of, and although it might be you know, an act of protection, protecting him from the sharp knives that she's using, it's also a metaphor. It's a juxtaposition of the battling cultures that are in her life. Elliot is a metaphor for the American culture that encroaches on her that she lives side by side, but she also fears, and that's why she doesn't let him get in that space, which is why she turns to food as her main form of empowerment. And now we're gonna talk about how these third spaces manifest physically in order to give these women a more tangible way in order to express themselves. So in the story, Mrs. Sen, Mrs. Sen substitutes uh, traditional ingredients used to make a Bengali dish with an American fish. She chooses to continue making the Bengali dish rather than just making something like hamburgers and fries, and this is a deliberate choice by Lahiri in order to turn the fish market into a physical manifestation of said third space. Through the purchasing of the American fish, she, through the purchasing of the American fish, she manages to carve out a space for herself in which she can feel comfortable in the host nation. After mourning her grandfather for a week, Mr. Sen takes Miss Sen and Elliot out to the fish market for a celebration. We see that this is a place that makes her feel comfortable. Furthermore, she's able to communicate in the fish market. She speaks with customers, the man behind the counter, and by proxy, when she can communicate, she can also navigate through the fish market. And this is kind of a reflection of how when she navigates through the fish market, she can navigate through the real world. The fish market gives her a space in which she can empower herself. Mrs. Sen also uses her kitchen as a third space um, where she's able to have a sense of agency through maintaining an abundance of ingredients and through imitating her home community. She maintains control over her kitchen by choosing which ingredients she both buys and prepares in her kitchen, therefore ensuring that both her husband and Elliot are dependent on her. She also maintains a surplus of these ingredients, uh, therefore nurturing the both of them, in which she uses domesticity as a way to gain agency and therefore be empowered. She also imitates her home community through using a curved knife and many detailed uh, cooking rituals to imitate the flavors and culture of her home nation. Though she uses typically American ingredients and is in her American home, she still is able to have a third space where both of those cultures are together without any one of them dominating. So Mrs. Sen has the ingredients to assimilate, but doesn't use the kitchen to fit in with American culture or a to Bengali culture. Though mothers still face stereotypes in patriarchal society, they react to them by fulfilling their given domestic role and using it to empower themselves without attaching to a specific culture. It is important to note though that despite her attachment to her host nation providing her agency, it also limits her ability to move forward in America. Now we're going to investigate the intersections of food, identity, and agency. Through the purchasing, cooking, and consumption of food, these literary mothers manage to develop agency for themselves in the host nation. They have the ability to decide how much of their host nation do they want to adapt, how much of their native nation do they want to retain. And this is an important concept because the third space means that these mothers don't have to give up their agency and have to assimilate in order to kind of adapt and live and navigate in the host nation. Instead, they carve out spaces for themselves to exist as South Asian women in um, America, and more particularly, South Asian mothers. And so, in conclusion, 
Third, space is formed through the purchasing, preparation, and consumption of it. food empowers Mrs. Sen because they give her the space to seize control over the challenges she faces as a migrant mother. Though some might say that she could be an outsider, she uses domesticity uh, through taking care of both her husband and Elliot to gain agency, thus she does not see herself as an outsider. Although domesticity itself doesn't resolve these issues, our analysis is important because it draws attention to the much overlooked means to mitigate them. Thank you. Salty stories of political unrest. During wartime, women are given the responsibility of caretaker while men are deployed at war. The effects of a mother's parenting style on a child's development are heightened during political unrest because oftentimes she is a sole caretaker in the absence of the father. The responsibility of motherhood can be quite overwhelming, especially at times of war. Women are more vulnerable to sexual assault and gender based violence at times of war, as women are generally symbolic of new life. Women that survive political unrest oftentimes raise their daughters to internalize their struggles, fearful of their daughters suffering from a similar fate as them. This phenomenon is quite common and is formally known as intergenerational trauma. Research on intergenerational trauma and violence against women during times of political unrest has revealed that its influences are gender specific and heightened in women. According to the findings of the American Medical Association research study on Finnish children whose parents were evacuated during World War II, daughters of mothers who were evacuated were twice as likely to be hospitalized for psychiatric disorders than their female cousins of mothers who were not evacuated. Furthermore, a World Health Organization study revealed that during times of conflict, women are often victims of sexual and physical assault, and they exchange sex for safety. The loss of law and order in these conditions causes an increase in violence towards women, both by the enemy and domestically, especially with the existence of an underlying acceptance of violence against women in many societies. The intergenerationality of this trauma is revealed in A Woman and Salt, The Joy Luck Club, and On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, through motifs of each family's trauma. A stronger connection can be made between the experiences of a mother and her daughter due to the gender-specific violence and vulnerability of political conflict, and how this shapes the way a mother parents her daughter. The transmission of this trauma through the generations manifests into an increase of sexual and gender-based violence, developmental challenges, and feeling of self-blame in the daughter as a result of her mother's past trauma. Our anchor text, Gabriela Garcia's of Women in Salt reveals the lasting intergenerational trauma caused, caused by the Cuban Revolution and how these women become accepting of their oppressions. Psychological effects of intergenerational trauma are exhibited through the story of multiple generations of Cuban American women as they experience heightened depression during times of political unrest. During times of war, women are subjected to more forms of sexual and gender-based violence developmental challenges and self-blame. The patriarchy contributes to the oppression of women by normalizing the acceptance of these conditions. Gender is a contributing factor to the transmission of trauma because a woman dealing with trauma while simultaneously raising a daughter is most likely to project all her fears and anxieties onto her daughter as she grows up. Mother-daughter mother relationships are more prone to inter intergenerational trauma than their male counterparts because of their shared gender struggles, ostracizing them within their own families.
The Cuban Revolution brings economic struggle and directly intensifies the marital, physical, and sexual abuse Dolores endures from her husband. Gender roles confine Dolores to the responsibilities of a domestic housewife while her husband fights in the war and in turn relieves the pressures he faced by physically and sexually abusing Dolores when he returns from the war. In order to protect herself and her children, Dolores decided to kill her husband in hopes of creating a better life for her family. This choice greatly troubled her daughter Carmen as she stood horrified as her father was burned to flames. Unable to cope with the trauma of watching her father be murdered by her own mother, Carmen fled Cuba and immigrated to the United States. However, she wasn't able to escape her trauma, and Carmen ended up in a similar situation to her mother. Carmen's violent father conditioned her to accept the sexual abuse in her own marriage, just as her mother did for many years. Carmen justifies her own marital abuse and blames herself, as her trauma led her to believe that her husband's activities were acceptable. Trapped in her world of insecurity and guilt, Carmen is unaware that her husband is also sexually abusing their daughter, Jeanette. Carmen's inability to cope with her childhood trauma is transmitted to Jeanette, only furthering the cycle of abuse between mothers and daughters. Carmen and Jeanette become part of a cycle where they have become accustomed to experiencing sexual abuse, even blaming themselves for not being able to overcome this trauma, and find it nearly impossible to escape this cycle. These experiences of abuse greatly hinder their ability to communicate and overcome other challenges in their life. These developmental challenges caused by the lingering trauma stemming from the first instance of abuse caused by the political unrest in Cuba, Garcia creates a parallel between these two mother-daughter relationships because the political unrest in Cuba caused Dolores trauma that persisted through three generations and caused further abuse, developmental challenges, and feelings of self-blame. A woman in salt alludes to the significance of gender and mother-daughter relationships and intergenerational trauma through the motif of Lehmann's, which is a symbolic representation of intergenerational trauma specific to mothers and daughters. The book is first seen handed down to Dolores by her grandmother while experiencing marital abuse caused by the political unrest in Cuba. Jeanette then comes in contact with this book while visiting Dolores and recognizes that during times of war, the oppression of women must be recognized and remedied so that it doesn't continue to affect future generations of women and daughters. Carmen is unable to pass the novel down to her daughter after Jeanette overdoses and thus passes it down to an undocumented child named Anna, whom Jeanette had taken in. Carmen physically passes this book down to Anna, showing that Carmen now views Anna as a daughter. Giving Anna this book represents a break in the lineage of trauma at the end of the novel because Carmen, Carmen will now have a second chance in raising a daughter and hopes to over, overcome the trauma that she faced in the past. With lives equally as shaped by the wartime conditions they faced, the family of Chinese woman in William Ling's 1993 film, The Joylet Club, and specifically Su Young and her daughter June, experience disconnect and developmental challenges as June perseveres through her family's relentless task. Gender-based violence during times of war and its impacts on intergenerational trauma are seen in Su Young, as she is forced to flee her home and abandon her babies during the Japanese invasion of China during World War II. The displacement of Su Young and her babies is the direct result of war violence because all parental responsibilities are placed on the women of families as men are typically deployed during times of war. The displacement and role of the caretaker are given to Su Young because she is a woman, and due to this extension of violence during the invasion, she is left a victim of this political unrest with few options for herself and her children. Additionally, the challenges facing one's personal growth caused by intergenerational trauma are further revealed in June's experiences in the Joy Life Club. June's struggles are a result of the transmission of her mother's trauma from being forced to abandon her twin babies during World War II. As a result of this traumatic experience, Su Young developed high expectations for June in order to in order to redeem herself as a mother. Su Young places pressure on June to be exceptional. As a child, June is unable to maximize her full potential as a pianist because she succumbs to the overwhelming pressures of her mother. June's confidence is destroyed by her mother's trauma response, and in turn, she grows dependent on approval from her mother. Experiencing the trauma her mother endures as a result of her own insecurity, uncertainties as a mother, June fails to develop maturely and becomes dependent on her mother's 
The cycle of abuse and self-blame that results in different generational trauma can also be seen within June. June is forced to bear the expectations and dreams her mother had for her long-lost sisters. Even upon Suyoung's death, June still seeks her validation and blames herself for their unhealthy relationship. In the scene before June leaves to meet her sisters, her father attempts to explain Suyoung's coldness and authoritarian parenting style, which June replies, well, I guess I was never very good at listening to her. June develops a high emotional neediness and an immature dependency on her mother as a result of the high expectations Suyoung has due to her own traumatic experiences. The sacrifices Suyoung made in her past now define the qualities that she embraces in motherhood. In failing her twins, or at least believing that she did, Suyoung overcompensates with June by envisioning her to be the perfect daughter, which in turn make, would make her the perfect mother for the success. June cracks under the pressures placed upon her and relies on reassurances from her mother as she now lacks, lacks these qualities within herself. Ho Shin Wang's novel On Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous follows roles of Vietnamese women suffering from PTSD and schizophrenia, her son Little Dog, and her mother Lon. Rose frequently struggles with self-acceptance, self-blame, and seeking help. Having grown up the biracial daughter of a schizophrenic worker in Vietnam, Rose experiences great isolation, emotional torment, and physical abuse. Lan was unable to raise her daughters to have self-love or healthy coping mechanisms as she was still struggling with the rejection from her mother and community in late adulthood. Over the years, Lan's schizophrenia worsened, especially after being exposed to the Vietnam War. The upbring this upbringing had a severe impact on Rose's development. Although a grown woman and mother, Rose still craves outside validation and indulges in immature behavior such as coloring, sp spending recklessly, and resorting to violence. Studying the transmission of trauma from a mother to her daughter will aid in the prevention of women being forced to endure further violence and abuse. Without an understanding of her mother's past, a daughter becomes an outsider to her family, continuing to suffer through her isolation from the events and induce this trauma, yet not its after effects. The lives of each new generation of women will be controlled by the trauma of those before them if society has not recognized this as a gender-specific issue. The study of intergenerational trauma will serve as a foundation for studies, society's understanding of not only the violence women face during times of political unrest, but more importantly, for women to acknowledge and amend the influences of intergenerational trauma. Shooting someone. I don't know if you've read the rest of the book. Oh, okay, awesome. 
So in another book there is Mrs. Doss, who is an actual mother. But we wanted to show, I guess, unconventional unconventional methods of empowerment for mothers and mother like figures. And we think that Mrs. N really exemplified that through her cooking. Because I think at first glance, you may look at her and think that she's being held back, I would say, in the United States. But you can see that once we see things through her perspective, through the third space, she's actually empowering herself. So when we say have agency, that just means that women are able to like have control over their family um, and over their own identities. So while uh, oftentimes domestic mothers are seen as just serving their husband, their children, and their family, um, we wanted to kind of subvert that and say that they also use that domestic role to give themselves power. So we focus on the purchasing, uh, preparation and consumption of food, and those three processes are ways that women are able to control the ingredients they have in their kitchen, control the meals in their kitchen, and control what gets eaten, so that therefore they are influencing their husband and their child, which we say is valuable. Thank you. 
So with these two texts in consideration, our thesis is that time travel as a protocol helps portray the trope of the outsider in a more convincing manner than the traditional linear protocol, and also allows authors to depict their social and scientific ideologies in a more unique way. So here are the four main points that we'll be going over to support our thesis. First, we'll give some context to time travel in literature. Then we'll talk about how time travel can better frame an outsider. Then we'll talk about characters' experiences of time travel, and lastly, how time travel allows authors to generate social commentary. So first up, we'll talk about the history of time travel in literature. So before physical books and manuscripts existed of time travel, a lot of ancient myths around the world involved the concept of time travel. In the 1700s and 1800s, when time travel became more prevalent in science fiction novels, a lot of authors took advantage of this opportunity. In 1895, H.G. Wells published The Time Machine, which many considered to be the first book that popularized and substantiated the idea of time travel. In 1979, Hiroyuki Butler published our second text, Kindred, and lastly, in today's times, we see time travel being used in all forms of media.
we see that this was actually why the Jew was so righteous. He wanted to correct the misconception of popular Victorian era culture that humanity was the pinnacle of life and the most evil source. We see that throughout the text, the evil that represents the dim future of humanity is left untouched by Talia's change. The system remains the exact Jew way because of their simple minded natures and their inability to perform tasks that many would consider considered simple now. They lack the ability to This is Hope, and this is Gussie. Our presentation is titled Romantic Resolution, Roses in the Archive in Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South. Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South revolves around the regional conflicts that result from the romantic relationship between Margaret Hale from the pastoral town of Helstone and John Thornton from the industrial town of Milton. This unique depiction of the relationship allows several scholars to coin the relationship of industrial romance which captures the tensions and resolutions between nature and industry, Margaret and Thornton, and romanticization and industrialism. Our analysis focuses on the final answer of the novel. Here, Thornton presents preserved roses, which he gathered from Pastel to Margaret. We examine the function of these roses within their relationship and through an archival lens. We ultimately found that beyond their adopted romantic signification, the roses accrue layered meaning throughout the novel to ultimately communicate the necessity of compromise in any relationship. We first get started by understanding the context of roses without its traditional meaning. To better understand the symbolism of roses, we decided to research the history of roses in roses literature. We first examined the fairy tales. Beth Gell wrote fairy tales and incorporated elements of them into her own novels. The brothers Grimm, Snow White, and Rosa, and Little Briar Rose strongly romanticized roses, as only by the fair title. The roses do not always have, have a romantic association, they are heavily emphasized throughout these texts. We also have Shirley by Charlotte Bronte, which scholars say directly influenced Rose and South. In Shirley, roses and flowers are very romanticized, as they bring on multiple occasions with romantic signification. Lastly, we examine Mary Barton by Rosa Gaskell. Gaskell refers to roses as love tokens, which implies her romanticization of roses. We want to see if she has a similar approach to Rose and South. In fact, this romanticization was so pronounced that movements of criticism arose. William Shakespeare's famous line, Romeo and Juliet, a rose by any other name is, would smell less sweet, and Gertrude Stein's famous quote, a rose is a rose is a rose, are prime examples which suggest that roses have alternative signification. Rosa Stroud is the next version of the rose's constantly changing signification. We then examine how Gaskell portrays roses in Northern South. One key instance is when Margaret describes Hellstone to Mr. Lawrence, referring to the roses in Hellstone. We see that Margaret associates the roses with Hellstone, demonstrating 
during a length of three weeks too. It also shows the strong emotional ties Margaret has with both Elizabeth and Tolson. Another instance is when Margaret moves into her new home in Dublin and is disgusted by the pink and blue roses with yellow leaves inside the wallpaper. Laura later discreetly takes this down. When Margaret loves roses, the wallpaper is a mere representation of roses, not the actual thing. That's got the new age industrial romance conflict between nature and, and artificiality through this example. The third example is when Margaret revisits Tolson. She expects to see the wondrous Tolson she lives in, but instead she is met with disappointment. Tolson used to be so beautiful that even a stray rose leaves look like a slut. But now Tolson's natu natural beauty was tainted by the people there. The Samuskis association of roses with emotion. Margaret is nostalgic for the old Tolson. Roses are traces of Margaret's old version of Tolson, the one that she loved and admired. It's not this newly changed Tolson. The last example of roses is a continuation of the scene in which Thornton presents dry roses to Margaret, as shown by the quote on the slide. To provide some context, they, they reunite after a period of separation, and they finally express their feelings for each other. The empty roses align with these aftermath instances and that they're unique because of the context surrounding them. The fact that Thornton went to help them to learn more about Margaret's past and identity shows that emotion felt. Roses do not just carry romantic sentiment. Roses, specifically these dry roses, are particularly special in the context of the story. Referring back to Kristen's distinction, we can then look at the contextual significance of these empty roses as dirty and hard drive. When Thornton first produces the roses, he does not simply hand them to Margaret immediately. Instead, Thornton draws these roses from his pocketbook, where they have been consciously stored since an initial visit to Halston. This is what allows Margaret to ultimately recognize her hometown through deep indentations around the leaves. This distinct detail proves Thornton's deliberate preservation of the roses in a non incidental manner. In this way, Thornton makes the conscious decision to remember Margaret, not for the short length of time of roses in their natural life, but rather for a much longer period of time. This longer time frame allows further associations and the layers of meaning to have their share of encounters with the roses. Initially, the untucked roses in Hellstone are tied with Margaret and her idealized hometown. Thornton's visit to Hellstone, his pocketing preservation of the roses, inscribes his use of presence with added significance. Through human intervention, these roses morph from their emblematic representation of Hellstone and Margaret to a metonymic image of Thornton's presence and desires to remember Margaret. Her discussion of roses with these previously mentioned layers of meaning distinctly relate to French philosopher Jacques Derrida's discussion of archives. Derrida defined an archive as the following. Not only the history and the memory of singular events of exemplary proper names, language of conciliation, but the deposition in an archaeon, which can be an arc or a temple, the consignation in a place of relative exteriority, whether it has to do with writings, documents, or ritualized marks on the body pocket. In this way, an archive is a physical object, or an archive, used to recall particular associations with memories of the objects which it replaces. When Thornton visits Hellstone, the roses retain their archival function as a memory of Margaret's hometown. Then, Thornton's plucking and preservation of the roses was his consignation of them. From this point on, Margaret remembers the roses not merely in association with Hellstone, but also with the added mark of Thornton's action. With this information, we can confirm the roses in Norton's set as a Derridian representation of an archive. The interactions associated with the roses, with Thornton, with Margaret, and their surrounding context suggest that several layers of meaning accrue over time to represent different archival representations for different people. Still, it is crucial to note that while the archives are an established romantic symbol, dead roses themselves hold no intrinsic value. Without a proper understanding of Hellstone, Margaret, Thornton, and their backstories, it is impossible to see the value of the archive. We must learn to understand the subtle traces of the history of the roses to understand the importance of the roses themselves. Dorita describes archives with a deconstructible history as understanding the events and memories associated with an archive or what constitute the archive's otherwise useless signification. The larger context of the Ensign Roses, particularly following Thornton's preservation of them, are discussed in more detail on the following slide. Indeed, what Thornton does next with the roses complicates the archival analysis greatly. As seen in this quote, Margaret demands the roses from Thornton, and he exchanges them for a kiss and a verb new relationship with Margaret. Since most studies of archive theory are concerned with an archive when it is being kept, as that is its fundamental purpose, it is interesting to examine the implications of when an archive is given up, or in this case, exchanged. 
and when we did investigate this transfer, we reached some noteworthy conclusions. First, we found that when a possessor creates an archive, he does so by inscribing himself onto the archive through the act of paying donation. We went over Dorita's postulation earlier that an archive is made by being imbued with some sort of value, whether that be through writings, documents, or other marks. In this sense, an archive is primarily created by inscription. So as Rachel mentioned, Thornton inscribes his love and desire for Margaret, including her more sympathetic romanticist values, onto the preserved roses. And this begs the question as to why he would give those roses up. But our second conclusion regarding archive theory helps to explain this, and that is the value of an archive is always fractional. With this in mind, it only makes sense that Thornton would give up the roses, which represent but a fraction of Margaret, in return for Margaret herself. And this exchange also makes sense as we return to the idea of archival inscription. When Margaret becomes the owner of the archive, the roses too experience a change in meaning. For Margaret, the roses replace a different absence, that created by the loss of Hellstone in her life. And in this transition, they are then inscribed with their own personal meaning, in addition to and in replacement of the meaning Thornton had previously inscribed on the roses. Thus, this exchange reveals interesting implications about the relationship between owner and archive. But there is yet a larger context to consider. A macroscopic study of North and South easily reveals that the novel's events primarily concern the romantic resolution towards which Thornton and Margaret approach. As you can see here, while they come from very different backgrounds and perspectives, they reach a common understanding of each other over the course of the novel. So the fact that Margaret and Thornton reach this common understanding is well acknowledged in the academic community. How they term this process, however, is an entirely different matter. For example, Kathleen Page has called it mutual folklorization, while Kathleen Anderson and Kelsey Sadolino call it a revision of their respective paternalist and liberal agendas. While all of these labels are reasonable, we propose that it is best to term Margaret and Thornton's process of reaching a common understanding as compromise. After examining Gaskell's own use of the word compromise, we determine that entry four in the Oxford English Dictionary is the most accurate definition for our purposes. As shown on the slide, a compromise is coming to terms by concessions on both sides. Indeed, Margaret and Thornton's relationship is based on compromise, acts of conceding and receiving, as in order to gain an understanding of each other's perspectives, Thornton and Margaret must inherently give up some of themselves, whether that be their pride, naivety, or <coughs> own prejudice. And in fact, when we consider compromise in conjunction with archival theory, the two fit rather well. We see that Margaret and Thornton's compromises are dependent on there being losses and replacements in perspective. Furthermore, the archival meanings that Margaret and Thornton inscribe onto the preserved roses are strikingly similar to the very same conclusions that they reach in their own compromise. And so the exchange ultimately serves to echo and reinforce the same compromises that Margaret and Thornton's relationship is based on. The major takeaway then is the idea of compromise, as it resonates within every level of the scene. It is evident within each archive created from the roses by Margaret and Thornton, and within the later exchange of the roses and their respective significations. And so we propose that Gaskell's parting message to the reader is this. Compromise in any relationship is necessary, whether that be between lovers, between an archive and its owner, or even between industrialization and romanticization. And in fact, as the novel draws to a close, one last archive is created as the preserved roses become an archive for the reader, and now also for you as the audience. The final exchange of these preserved roses is highly reminiscent of all the earlier compromises and events of the novel the audience has seen. And thus fittingly, the roses serve as a metaphorical replacement for the coming absence of the novel in one final act of deception. We'd like to thank Professor Garcia, Mr. Sweeney, and Professors Norton and Cooper. Let's give her a little
them out of another and move them into that other. Now, normally with normal evolution, you'd expect a gradual progression in the way that person thinks or the way that person acts, right? But because they still maintain those same set of parameters, but they use a completely different one, they still have those very different ideals now that they're in a completely different environment. Because of that, they develop a very outsider life. some ancient myths that dealt with time travel. Did they actually provide a similar function with that societal <coughs> reflection or just the opposite? Because I, I, I don't know them from, when they were on the screen, they went by so fast, and I don't think I recognized any of them to know. So ancient myths, did they follow the same societal? Commentary? Yeah, commentary. Sorry, sorry. Um, so a lot of these ancient myths that we put up on the board, a lot of them just simply use time travel as a mechanism to help further a certain story or a certain plot. But like we mentioned with our thesis text, namely um, The Time Machine and Kindred, these two texts actually substantiated and um, further elaborated upon the mechanism of time travel instead of simply stating, oh, 100 years later, 1,000 years later, they actually explained and explored the differences between the society before and after 